All right, do you think we should get started? All right. Hello, everyone. Um, we're now at 63 participants, which is really exciting. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I want to welcome you to this, which is our third event um, hosted by the University of Pennsylvania Southeast Asia Working Group. We are excited and grateful to have a conversation today with Dr. Saroja Dore Raju on Chinese privilege in Singapore. I'm going to first begin with a land acknowledgement. We're um, zooming in uh, those of us with SEAG uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. And I wanna thank the Association of Native Alumni at the University of Pennsylvania for providing this land acknowledgement. We recognize and acknowledge that the University of Pennsylvania stands on the indigenous territory known as the Lenape Hoking, the traditional homelands of the Lenape, also called Leni Lenape or Delaware Indians. These are the people who during the 1680s negotiated with William Penn to facilitate the founding of the colony of Pennsylvania. Their descendants today include the Delaware tribe and the Delaware nation of Oklahoma and the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape, Ramapo Lenape and Powhatan Lenape of New Jersey and the Muncie Delaware of Ontario. And now I'll pass it over to my colleague Juan. Thank you, Becca. So by way of introducing ourselves, the Southeast Asia Working Group, or SEAG in short, is a new collective of multidisciplinary, critically engaged scholars who are building on the generative intellectual traditions central to Southeast Asian studies. It treats these traditions as avenues that will allow for the decolonizing of methodologies and the development of new solidarities, which expand the boundaries of conventional area studies. Currently, the steering committee consists of myself, Rebecca Winkler, Praveen Vijaya Kumar, and Assistant Professor Andrew Caritas as our faculty advisor. So let me just um, share screen maybe in a bit. The group aims to increase the representation of scholarship on the region by especially highlighting the work of Southeast Asian scholars. So, John, all right. Okay, so SEAG has organized a few seminars and dialogues with practitioners and academics this past few months with Lillian Fan speaking on the recent military coup and ongoing violence in Myanmar and Dr. Una Paredes on the development and future of Southeast Asian studies. And today we are grateful to have Dr. Saroja Dorai Raju to speak to us about racial politics in Singapore. We will also be organizing a final sem seminar for the spring semester on May 3rd on the topic of environmentalism and populism in Thailand with Dr. Pinkau and we'll wrap up the spring semester with a get together session the week after. And we invite you to join us then. So we will continue to organize seminars, dialogues, as well as reading groups and curating spaces to discuss works in progress. If you are interested in joining the working group, Please drop us an email, or if you'd like to be added to our mailing list, you can send an email with your name to the stated email address, and it will automatically subscribe you to our list. So to keep updated about our upcoming events, please follow us on our Instagram at seag underscore upen, and we will put all these details in the chat box. So uh, with that, I'm just going to pass the time now to Praveen to introduce our wonderful speaker and take the session away. So Praveen, I'm just going to hand it to you now. Thank you, Vani. Hello, everyone. I'm Praveen Vijay Kumar, and I'll be introducing both the topic at hand and our speaker. Privilege, the noun denoting special advantage or right available to a particular person or group is being explored in multitudinous ways by scholars from various disciplines. I would like to share some recent conversations on the subject, albeit very briefly by way of introducing Dr. Saroja Dure Raju. My intention here, and I would assume our shared interest here is to think more carefully, but also broadly about where privilege lives and how it is sustained. In her recent essay entitled, Thinking About Caste, the Indian historian Uma Chakravarti notes concepts of purity and pollution key concepts that effectuate caste society as a smokescreen that reproduces structures of and so reinforces inequality as well as resolutely, quote, ensures the continuation of the social power of the privileged, end quote, in India. Chakravarti's usage of the term smokescreen to describe cultural practices highlights the potential 
for privilege to be obscured in the South Asian context. In their monograph on race and ethnicity in the United States, sociologist Kathleen Fitzgerald explains that, quote, part of white privilege involves the treatment of white people as individuals without all of their actions being attributed to their membership in a racial group, end quote. Fitzgerald thus suggests that privilege omits some groups, in this case, white Americans from being associated with activities, for example, unlawful activities that were undertaken by members of the same group, while the same approach does not apply to other groups. Privilege then appears to embody the ability to obfuscate one group's advantageous position from being recognized and relationally disapproved of, while simultaneously allowing the same group to enjoy exceptional access and maintain the advantageous position in society. Chinese Privilege in Singapore, Fact or Fiction, is the title of our speaker, Dr. Saroja Dure Raju's paper today. A Harvard-trained anthropologist, Dure Raju's bold work has excited conversations around food, environmentalism, gender, violence, and more recently, privilege. Currently a senior lecturer at the National University of Singapore, Dure Raju previously taught at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and was a postdoctoral associate at Yale University. Their work has brought them to Malaysia, Thailand, as well as China. They have received awards from the Prince of Songkhla University, Harvard University, the National University of Singapore, and the Asian Research Institute, also Singapore. Dure Raju is the founder of the Asian Living Institute of Food Futures, or ALIF, a result of their fieldwork in China. Through the institute, Dure Raju is determined to engage in research and education on regenerative food production and consumption in a post-pandemic world that will create a paradigm shift in the way we consume and produce. Dure Raju is also a firm believer that teaching transforms lives and has labored to provide not only an invigorating learning environment for students, but also instill in them ethics, the ethic to share their findings with the communities and corporations they have worked with and to proactively apply their knowledge to improve society. Dure Raju's classrooms have regularly hosted activists, politicians, and scholars. They include Theo So Lung, a lawyer who was detained under the Internal Security Act for two years for her alleged involvement in a Marxist conspiracy in Singapore in 1987. M. Ravi, also a lawyer as well as activist, was taken up court cases, many of which he did pro bono, relating to human rights issues, the death penalty, and LGBTQ and voting rights in Singapore. P.J. Tham, a historian who was reprimanded by a select committee and directly questioned by the Law and Homes Minister for their credibility as a historian for suggesting that persons were detained without trial between 1963 and 1988 for their alleged participation in a communist plot. Vincent Vijay Singer, an activist and politician from an opposition party and the country's first openly gay politician. Alex Wu, an LGBTQ rights activist, and Roy Tan, a healthcare worker, LGBTQ activist, and the main organizer of Pink Dot in 2009, an event that has since been celebrated almost annually in Singapore and birthed Pink Dot events worldwide. Dure Radu has also organized several conferences and workshops, most notably the first inter-dialogue conference on Southern Thailand and his work and a workshop titled Eat, Drink, Halal, Haram, Food Society and Islam in Asia. More recently in 2019, they were involved in co-organizing a conference titled Does Invisible Privilege Travel? Looking beyond the geographies of white privilege, which forms the basis of today's talk. Without further ado, please allow me to pass the screen over to our much admired speaker, Dr. Saroja Dure Raju. I'll be collating your questions to share them with our speaker at the end of the talk during the question and answer session. Please share them with me in a private message or in the group chat, or unmute yourself to ask Dr. Dure Raju your questions. Thank you. Oh, you're muted, Saroja. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Thank you, thank you, Praveen, and thank you, everybody. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, Okay, um, I think I would like to share screen, but that's been disabled. Can I, can I, allow, can you allow me to share screen, please? Yeah, I think it has been enabled now. Maybe you can try. Ah, okay. Let me see. Okay. 
Yes, there we go. Okay. Uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, Praveen, a dear friend, for inviting me to give a talk today. So I told when when Praveen asked me to give this talk, I was thinking to myself, okay, you know, what do I talk about since we've just, um, <clears throat> you know, um, ended this conference that we organized myself and Dr. Lavanyaka the Relu from NTU, who's in the audience today since we just organized this conference and we are actually um, working on a special issue of current sociology to publish some of the papers that were presented at this conference. Maybe I should talk about privilege. And um, since um, I teach sociology and um, there are aspects of Chinese privilege that I discuss in my lecture, I said, hmm, why don't I just, you know, <clears throat> talk about it. Um, and um, when Praveen sent me the, the guest list, um, it wasn't surprising that there were so many people who had signed up uh, because, you know, the topic just seems to be very, very popular uh, in Singapore, despite the fact that there has been so many um, talks, discussion around the issue, it still continues to evoke a lot of attention, especially from um, Singaporeans. So without further ado, let me um, to um, introduce some points um, that I would like to discuss today in this talk, yeah? So I've entitled the talk, Chinese Privilege in Singapore, an attempt to frame its uh, boundaries. A Burmese maid, Tang Jo Lek, was slept at 5.40 a.m. She was doing her laundry at that time by her Indian Singaporean employer, Gayatri Iyer, for failing to wake Gayatri's son who was doing national service. Gayatri slept the maid twice on her left ear and once on her right. The maid suffered hearing loss on her left ear for a month. Gayatri, a former prison counselor, was sentenced to seven months in prison last Wednesday by a Singapore district court judge. Now, what has this recent criminal incident got to do with today's talk on Chinese privilege, you might wonder. This was exactly my thought when I received the above news via WhatsApp from my sociology colleague after he had read the abstract of my talk today. This made mom soldier case is an example of the evils of privilege. Privileged sons can't do proper military service or fight a war when they depend on maid or mom to handle things taken for granted. A true soldier ought to know how to cook, clean, clear up mess, etc. Privilege in this sense is disastrous for an army that needs to defend a country. You, Saroja, should talk about this in your privilege lecture. Had my colleague read my abstract properly? I was going to talk about a specific form of privilege in Singapore, one labeled as Chinese privilege. But he continued, when you talk about whether there is or isn't any racial privilege, it is a war of words. It is internal squabbling. It may have no relevance to the audience, which is you. If you talk about maid mom soldier case, it has wider implications for the whole country. <clears throat> Privilege can't fight wars for the nation. Unless we depend on unlearning privilege to fend for ourselves independently. Those guys like me with no mates, no privilege had to do everything for ourselves when serving military. I'm not pushing my perspective. I'm just saying Academics must not say someone said this while another one said that. This can be interpreted as petty or so what? Someone has more power than another to define the world. So what? Better to show 